We're starting this session with a really hearty note of thanks to our previous panel uh, and again to uh, Tom and the steering committee for assembling uh, the, the set of panels today. Um, we have uh, many uh, both uh, ideas and motivations uh, for the uh, not only the discussions today but the follow on. And uh, I'll just pick up on one theme before I turn it over to uh, this panel. And um, the theme is uh, our interest in being practical about what we can do now and what we can't. So what we would like, and several folks have mentioned this um, uh, in, in the course of the last few minutes, um, it's important for uh, all of us uh, to keep at least three things in mind as we're sorting uh, through uh, that kind of practical taxonomy. Uh, one, let us know uh, what we can do now from your, in your opinion. Uh, not immediately, but uh, we're going to follow up and ask you these questions uh, after we leave. Secondly, uh, what's on the cusp? Uh, that we're able to use now. Um, and thirdly, um, what others, uh, in terms of potential applications, are out there, and this is going to be a large universe, what others are out there and what's needed to move up the application uh, chain, if you will, what's needed to get them in, in position. So. Uh, We'll follow up with a more articulate version of that uh, query, uh, uh, but uh, please keep thinking about it and jotting it down as you, as you go through the day. Um, now we're moving to uh, the uh, panel on anticipating unique risks in generative AI. Uh, and um, if anyone uh, who is not named Chris is not on the panel, please come on up and join. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but to uh, herd us through this uh, conversation, I'm pleased to introduce Jennifer Goldsack, uh, who founded and serves as the CEO of the Digital Medicine Society, uh, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing digital medicine to optimize human health. Uh, previously, uh, Jennifer spent several years at the Clinical Trials uh, Transformation Initiative, which is a public-private partnership uh, co-founded by Duke University. I'm sorry Victor isn't still here because his, his heart bleeds blue. Uh, and, uh, and the uh, uh, FDA, he spent uh, five years working in research at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, first in outcomes research in the Department of Surgery and later in the Department of Medicine. Uh, more recently, she um, helped launch the Value Institute, a pragmatic research and innovation center embedded in a large uh, academic medical center in Delaware. Jennifer, thank you very much uh, for, uh, uh, for, for moderating the conversation, and please join us. Fantastic. Thanks, Michael, and thanks to everyone today for uh, the opportunity, I think, for all of us to engage in this really important conversation. Um, our particular panel is going to be uh, sort of addressing and discussing uh, the unique risks in generative AI. Um, and after I introduce our exceptional panel, I will talk about why the unique caveat in there is so important. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce, uh, introduce Marcia Gassami, who is an assistant professor at MIT in electrical engineering and computer science uh, and the Institute for Medical Engineering Science and a Vector Institute faculty member holding a Canadian CIFAR AI chair and Canada Research Chair. She holds MIT affiliations with the Jamil Clinic and CSAIL. Marcia holds a Herman L. F. von Hemholtz career development professorship and was named a CIFAR Israeli Global Scholar and one of the MIT's uh, Tech Review's 35 Innovators Under 35. Previously, she was a visiting researcher with Alphabet's Verily and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. 
Prior to her PhD in computer science at MIT, she received an MSc degree in biomedical engineering from Oxford University, that's the blue that I'm all about, um, as a Marshall Scholar, um, and BS degrees in computer science and electrical engineering as a Goldwater Scholar at New Mexico State University. Uh, first up from Team Chris, uh, Christopher Chen is a medical director for Medicaid and clinical informatics at the Washington State Healthcare Authority. Dr. Chen is dedicated to serving the underserved and believes in the HCA's mission to use innovative policies and purchasing strategies to improve health and address disparities. He helps guide clinical policy and strategy at the agency and supports initiatives in health information technology, telehealth, quality and health equity. Also joining us uh, 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 over, the, over the ether is Nigam Shah. Uh, he's a professor of medicine at Stanford University and the chief data scientist for Stanford Healthcare. His research group analyzes multiple types of health data to answer clinical questions, generate insights, and build predictive models uh, for the learning health system. At Stanford Healthcare, he leads artificial intelligence and data science efforts for advancing the scientific understanding of disease, improving the practice of clinical medicine, and orchestrating the delivery of healthcare. Christina Silcox is the research director for digital health at the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. Working on policy solutions to advance innovation in healthcare and improve regulation, reimbursement, and long term evaluation of medical products, with a focus on digital health. Dr. Silcox's portfolio includes multiple areas in digital health policy and real-world evidence, with an emphasis on medical devices. Currently, she's concentrating on challenges to regulating and adopting uh, artificial intelligence-enabled software as a medical device, using mHealth to collect real-world data and characterizing the real-world data quality and relevancy. Finally, rounding out Team Chris, uh, is Christopher Cowery, Vice President of Strategic Insights at AMA. He focuses broadly on healthcare trends and their impact on the practice of medicine and public health. Chris is responsible for intelligence gathering and market research, industry analytics, strategic partnering, and innovation activities. Prior to AMA, he began his career as a product developer uh, at an advanced uh, diagnostics company, Nanosphere, and subsequently as a management consultant and healthcare researcher at Gallup and PricewaterhouseCoopers. So we certainly have the right panel today to be talking about these unique risks um, as we leverage generative AI. Uh, and I just want to put maybe one framing comment around this. So as someone who works at an organization called the Digital Medicine Society, quite clearly uh, I am an enthusiast vis-a-vis uh, -vis the use of digital tools in healthcare, but I think it's really important to delineate between being an enthusiast and being a determinist. Certainly we're not here to use these technologies and shove them into every nook and cranny of healthcare and say we did it. Um, but when we do have these conversations about challenges in digital health, sometimes honestly I want to throw myself out of the window. Because what I find can happen, especially in a room of terribly smart people indeed, is we dive right into the weeds and we focus on every single blade of grass that we could define as a problem. And what I want to reorient ourselves to now is that the house is on fire. When we think about the problems in healthcare, if we think about the fact that there are people with cancer for which there are either clinical trials that could potentially save their lives or that there are treatments out there that could save their lives, but because this world, this healthcare environment we live in is so complicated and so replete with so much data from which we cannot extract information when we need it, they are not connected to those solutions. If we think about the fact that 50 counties in the United States do not have a single mental health care provider, yet we find ourselves in a mental health care crisis. If we think about the fact that 50% of black Americans live in a county with no cardiologist, and yet we know the, bur the burden of cardiac disease is higher in black Americans, these are the problems that we are dealing with. And let us not forget the fact that those individuals who have sworn an oath um, in order to care for all of us, our clinical colleagues, are not only dropping out of the profession, at remarkably high rates, but they are also committing suicide at remarkably hard rates because this industry is so incredibly difficult. So I do not want to dismiss the importance of this conversation. There are risks. We must identify them, but picking up on what you said, Sebastian, it's our job here to say, where are the research questions in this? What are the problems that we need to answer in order to understand how we deploy these things? And that's the focus of this session.
We need to remember that clinical decision making is all about weighing the risks against the benefits. So while we think about the risks here, I do not want us to become overwhelmed with the fact that we need to figure out how to get the benefits of AI to return to us. So with that, fantastic presenters to get us started. And Marzia, we're going to come to you first. Thank you. I want to talk a little bit about the high-level problems that we've been focusing on in my group. And my group is called the Healthy Machine Learning Lab at MIT. We really try to focus on how we can take state-of-the-art methods and adapt them to healthcare settings, and also how we can use state-of-the-art methods to understand what sort of healthcare practices work best. And I want to talk to you about three areas where we've seen generative AI and specifically large language models have an impact in healthcare settings. So the first is in generation specifically. Generative AI in the work that we have done in the past uh, has demonstrably had uh, gaps in generation. Uh, so when we have looked at clinical note completion as a task or inference of outcomes from clinical notes, large language models and other language models like transformers generate differentially. They have worse or more biased responses for black Americans in our evaluations. And this is problematic because often when we deploy a model, we don't know all of the ways in which it might have a gap. And large language models do have these gaps, but once deployed, there's no um, specific rules governing exactly how they must be audited or tested before they can interact with a patient's healthcare data or generate messages or notes on behalf of a patient or a provider. The second thing I want to talk about is once we have data that perhaps has generative gaps in it, so we know that there's differences in how we generate this data with large language models, there's an extra issue that comes into play when we're labeling data that will be used by large language models. So what you may not be aware of is when we generate data in a machine learning setting, in order to predict uh, what a, a dog is, we need lots and lots of labels of dogs. And that's a descriptive label. We know that a dog is a dog. You're describing an object that's in an image. In recent work in um, science advances, we evaluated what happens when you uh, label an image descriptively. For example, saying a meal is a high sugar meal and then apply those labels to a normative context. For example, saying that a meal is not appropriate for a school that has a no sugar meal policy. And what we found is that when you give human labelers images of high sugar meals and ask them if it has high sugar, 17 out of 20 will say that a specific image does have high sugar if it's, for example, cocoa puffs and whipped cream. But if you ask people whether that same image violates a school meal policy that prohibits high sugar content, only two out of 20 will say that it does. And what's important here is that we always collect labels for models to learn on in a descriptive setting. Is this high sugar? And we always apply them in the normative setting. Does this meal violate a policy? And what we found is that when you collect data the way we tend to collect it from machine learning models and then apply it the way that we tend to apply it, large language models have much harsher judgments because they're mimicking these descriptive labels and using a better model, so a larger language model that tends to have better performance, doesn't close this gap because the labels themselves that are being used by models have this, this fundamental measurement error where we're training them to do something in a descriptive way, but the societal expectation is this will be sort of relaxed in a normative setting. The final thing I want to talk about is not how, you know, the, the generation has some biases, you know, perhaps there are technical or non-technical solutions to that. The labels that we generate, there are also issues with uh, that process. Perhaps there are technical or non-technical solutions to that. The last thing I want to talk about is how we use these methods, because no model will be perfect. There will be gaps, there will be biases, because these models are using human data, and humans generate uh, data with biases in it. What we have found recently when we've evaluated uh, the impact of giving biased GPT advice to people in a mental health crisis setting is very interesting. So we, we took a bunch of mental health crisis call transcripts, and then we asked people um, in this, uh, by viewing this transcript to make a simple decision. Should we ask for emergency medical help for this person who's calling in looking at this transcript, or should we contact the police? 
and we gave people training that they should call the police if and only if there was a risk of violence. So here again, there's a descriptive, if there's a risk of violence, judgment, and there's a prescriptive or a normative judgment, then you should call the police. And they are equivalent, just like they were in the meal setting. Um, so at baseline, what we found is that when you have a bunch of clinicians and non-clinicians evaluate these transcripts and then make judgments about whether there's a risk of violence and you should call the police, clinicians are not biased based on demographic features. So they don't call the police uh, disproportionately more for black or Muslim uh, minority subjects that are described in these notes. And the content of the note isn't changing. We're just changing what we say the demographic of the patient is. And then we took a GPT model and we intentionally biased it. This is easy to do, but I do not advise it. And we specifically made it racist. And what we found was that when you gave the racist model advice to both clinicians and non-clinicians, but you gave it to them with the if condition, you said there's a risk of violence and you always said there was a risk of violence for minority patients. Doctors and non-doctors retained their fair decision-making. They weren't swayed by this model, this racist GPT model saying there was always a risk of violence. So they didn't call the police disproportionately more. But when the model told them what to do, when it gave them the prescriptive advice and said, you should call the police, the model thinks you should call the police, both doctors and non-doctors were swayed and they did call the police disproportionately more for minority patients. And this is important because a lot of the research that we do in the machine learning and health space is really focused on improving data, improving methods, um, trying to do audits to reduce gaps, but we have very little work in this sort of interstitial space that's looking at how you actually take a model that might have biases. In this case, our model was intentionally extremely biased and still find ways to deliver the advice such that it doesn't disproportionately affect uh, judgments and have poor outcomes. And in a health space, there's many agencies that you could think of having a role in this larger um, setting of safe integration of technology. Um, and an example we can uh, learn from is aviation, where there is really strong formal feedback loops in the federal government um, from ASRS, the FAA, and TSB to uh, report, evaluate, and audit technology in aviation. There's a culture of safety. There are no blame spaces where investigations are done. And then um, uh, al there is a liability allocation fairly afterwards. And there's a lot of training. There are thousands of hours of simulation training so that pilots can interact with automated systems without engaging automation bias. And you can imagine there are many um, uh, regulatory entities that could have a part of this for health specifically. The FDA uh, could mandate audits of uh, algorithms. You could have the FTC or ARHQ perform some sort of monitoring. Uh, data availability is a huge issue. Open data availability for academic researchers is a huge issue. So you could imagine ARPA-H, for example, creating data banks for auditing services. Uh, CMS could tie um, uh, you know, reimbursement to uh, regulation or accreditation of some kind for methods that you choose to deploy. HHS could look at enforcement. And these are all just options. I think the, the larger question is, we know that models will not be perfect. We know that there could be huge advantages from deploying them. How do we deploy them in such a way that they tend to benefit patients in the course of practice rather than lead to harms? Thank you. Um, Marcia, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Terrific examples. Um, and I really like this culture of safety that you mentioned from the aviation industry. Safety is such an important word in healthcare, and I think there might be a lot of work that that term could do for us in this context. Chris. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm going to put myself solidly in Dr. Waldron's camp of why am I here today uh, in this room of experts, but hopefully um, can offer a little bit of the state perspective and the Medicaid perspective. Um, and um, 
Uh, I just want to start by maybe grounding ourselves in Medicaid. Um, again, I'm a medical director for Medicaid at the Washington State Healthcare Authority and also serving as chair for the National Medicaid Medical Directors Network um, this year. And as you all know, um, Medicaid is a cornerstone of our social safety net in this country, serving as an entitlement, entitlement program for some of our most vulnerable and disenfranchised um, members of our society. Um, eligibility criteria are large, largely grounded in income, and so for children, that's about 300% of the federal poverty limit or a household income of $70,000 for a family of three. Um, um, and 138% of the federal poverty limit, which is um, $20,000 for a household of one for adult um, expansion population. I usually say that to remind people because um, when I say that there are over 90 million people in this country who meet those criteria, um, in, in rooms like this where people are usually more well-resourced, we're surprised um, that how, how do families get by on this um, level of resources. Um, some more specific populations that we serve, um, Medicaid covers almost half the births and almost half the kids in this country, um, so it's crit really critical to healthy starts. Um, over 30% of individuals with disabilities um, are on Medicaid, um, and about 10% of those on Medicare are dual eligible, who are the most vulnerable among our elderly population. Um, we're disproportionately um, represented with um, minority populations and clients with high needs of social determinants of health. Medicaid is also the largest single payer of mental health services in this country. Um, and increasingly, states are experimenting um, in piloting programs, Medicaid lookalike programs for non-citizens as well, um, as, as well as um, uh, care coordination for justice-involved individuals. So um, these populations are really deeply important to, to us as an agency in Washington State, and, um, and they're who we strive to prioritize in all of the work that we do, including in our health IT initiatives. Um, and so some of, um, some of our health IT priorities as a state I'll just share, um, largely because you might not recognize them as uh, very technologically innovated. Some of these technologies were in, um, invented over 30 years ago. <laughs> um, but they are innovative from a policy perspective in that we're bringing them um, to people who've been traditionally left out of the, um, out of the um, digital modernization. And so one of those initiatives, we're partnering with Epic on providing a state option for an EHR for providers that were left out of high tech, <clears throat> including behavioral health providers, rural providers, tribal providers. Um, we're also um, working on developing a community information exchange um, to support resource and referral for health-related social needs, um, as well as integrated eligibility. And this is seen as a really important social determinants play for us um, in trying to get to a 20-minute online application for Medicaid, um, SNAP, um, cash and food assistance and child care benefits um, for clients. <clears throat> When I think about generative AI, I think there's lots of exciting possibilities um, for clients offering culturally attuned and tailored education, helping navigating and accessing what can be a really complex system of benefits. I think there's a New York Times article um, that I always reference that talks about how difficult it is to be poor in America and how much of an administrative burden we impose on our patients um, and um, um, opportunities in getting better services and care coordination. Um, and for states, there's a significant potential to make government more efficient. Um, and access alternate sources of unstructured data to develop really meaningful insights on quality of care um, and using new tools to combat mis- and disinformation. Um, but the, and when I think about the risks of um, generative AI, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, and uh, I think there's been a number of mentions about bias today. Medicaid clients are often not represented in base data sets that algorithms are trained on as a result of barriers in accessing care. Some of their providers are still on paper. Um, and additionally, regulatory um, considerations that disproportionately affect the population that we serve um, are really have a stronger influence, such as tribal sovereignty over data and privacy considerations around um, uh, around SUD data, um, for example, for two part two CFR. Um, there are meaningful risks to privacy for our clients who have a lower level of health literacy um, and also lack real or meaningful, meaningful controls of their personal data. Um, um, another concern that I have as a state um, from a clinical perspective is how is this going to affect our ability to act as stewards of public dollars? Um, and we really, and Medicaid medical directors really take seriously our role um, to um, be stewards of public resources and adhere to standards of evidence-based medicine um, we've seen um, kind of increasing prevalence of attestations of medical necessity on the basis of true or real or not real studies, um, and that's a concern. Um, and I'm also just concerned that our status as public entities means that we won't be able to take advantage of the potential of AI. Um, I think that there's kind of an inherent tension between the nature of our work as a public agency and the transparency that's required and the black box and some of the algorithms um, in artificial intelligence if it's not auditable, auditable or explainable. Um, 
and the, the greatest risk um, of generative AI that I see is that we just don't deploy this in a way that meaningfully improves health outcomes for our marginalized populations. Um, I mentioned before um, that history is filled with instances where technology doesn't benefit all of those equally. Um, I think there's often assumption that a rising tide lifts all boats without recognizing that some boats are floating at the top and some boats are at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and how do we kind of intentionally address disparities? Um, I think this, so um, just thinking of sharing a little bit of perspective about how we're thinking about this as a state. So we're very early in our journey, um, but we've um, at, at the Healthcare Authority have established an artificial intelligence um, ethics committee. This work is led by our chief data officer, um, Vishal Chaudhary, and the scope of our work is focused on our role as a regulator, purchaser, and payer, um, and thinking, um, and again, putting the, the um, our clients at the center of our work and complementing a lot of other efforts in healthcare. Um, we're exploratory at this phase. This government is sponsored by, I'm um, sorry, this um, committee is sponsored by our data governance and oversight committee um, and is tasked with developing and maintaining an AI ethics framework. Um, so we've been um, kind of inviting experts to come speak to our group. We've been looking at the AI Bill of Rights, the NIST standards, um, and focusing really on the ethical considerations around equitability, transparency, accountability, compliance, trustworthiness, and fairness. Um, and so our committee is chartered to grow a artificial expertise, artificial intelligence expertise at the agency, create transparent um, and consistent rules for its use, um, advance health equity and respect tribal sovereignty when it's applicable. Most of our experience thus far is with predictive AI, but we have seen some emerging use cases around generative AI. Um, and our committee also works really closely with our state office of the um, chief information officer. Um, so I, I guess in closing, just want to um, advocate for us as a community to work to solve the big problems that drive disparities in our health outcomes. Um, you know, we've, we've had many, many innovations in technology um, across the industry over the last few years, and yet as a country, our mortality rates, um, our, our life expectancy is decreasing as a result of crises in behavioral health and substance use. How do we um, target um, these tools to solve those big problems? Um, I think um, some actionable ideas are just kind of, um, I, I really appreciated the comment before on patients and how important they are to keep at the center of our work, um, including um, uh, not just um, reimbursing them, but training them and, and really meaningfully engaging patients and states um, in, in these kinds of conversations. Um, so yeah, look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thanks for having me. Um, Christopher, that was excellent, and I think so important. We do not have a good track record when it comes to innovation with technology or healthcare, that when we are successful in addressing the tip of the spear, that we go back for anyone. We don't, um, and thank you for giving that voice today. <clears throat> Next up, we've got Nigam Shah. Um, and Nigam, would you like to go ahead and make your remarks, please? Thank you. This is a wonderful opportunity, and I'm really bummed not to be there in person. I, on the camera, I recognize several uh, people I would want to catch up with. So uh, I only have two slides. I'm going to go slow and try to make a couple of points. Um, and uh, I was speaking with uh, some of the leaders from uh, Yale University yesterday and uh, a free ranging conversation where at the end of the day, somebody asked me, like, are you a skeptic when it comes to generative AI? And I was like, it might sound that way, but I would rather characterize it as a hype buster rather than a uh, uh, skeptic. Uh, because I see there's immense promise uh, that these new technologies hold. And I mean, we saw some of the amazing capabilities this morning, uh, but I feel that that promise may be lost or somehow uh, sort of fail to realize it, uh, given that as academics and as, the, as people on the cutting edge, we tend to over promise and often under deliver actually. And my exhibit A in that is the the Human Genome Project, which happened when I just entered grad school and uh, I was told cancer was going to be cured by 2010. Uh, well, he here we are in 2023, but the progress made by that has been amazing, like nothing short of amazing. And uh, as uh, Victor Zhao was saying a little while ago, you know, can we find areas where there's real value, it is safe, and we can make tangible progress uh, instead of uh, sort of this risk I see of over-promising and under-delivering. The second sort of big high-level uh, opening risk that I see is uh, there we might be in a situation where corporate interests are driving the national conversation in Gen AI. And uh, you know, again, going back to the Human Genome Project, imagine if Celera had won and the public project had failed. 
um, what would have happened? How would the world be different today? And right now, there's not one academic amongst the, uh, no, not one university or academic center amongst these creators of large language models. Uh, you look at GPT, BARD, MedPom, Claude, all are coming from uh, .coms and not from .edu's. So we do have to recognize that universities, which are traditionally sort of the leaders in biomedical research, are in some sense falling behind here. Uh, so those are sort of the two big macro risks, like we overpromise, underdeliver under deliver as a, as a general field. And uh, uh, we, we, universities and institutions like the National Academy of Medicine uh, are not in the driver's seat when development and steering of these technologies and their next developments happen. So that's sort of the framing comment. You know, not one something that one faculty member can do about it, but I think we as a community, we got to acknowledge that uh, we are at risk uh, in, in that manner. So if we go to the uh, next slide, the two specific things I want to uh, 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 communicate with this uh, audience today is that it was mentioned earlier that uh, you know 80% of uh, uh, of the work is the systems issues and only 20% of it is AI, and given systems issues, we failed to get value from regular AI or traditional AI, so to speak. And the reason, sort of, at least in my interpretation, is that there's an interplay amongst what models give us, what our policies and capacities are to take action, and the net benefit or sort of cost and harm structure of the actions themselves. And good AI guided work happens as an interplay of all of these three. And as uh, Marze gave an example in, in the Gen AI case, you can have a biased model, but if you have your policy right and the way you're presenting the information, you can overcome that. Um, in the traditional uh, or, or non-generative AI space, I'm sure all of you in the room have seen hundreds or maybe thousands of predictive models that have been sold to you under population health, you know, readmissions predictions and sepsis predictions and whatnot. And often we don't have the policies and the work capacity designs set up correctly to achieve the promised usefulness that we could have gotten. And so the, the, the risk I see is that we didn't get it right for the traditional or regular AI. What are we doing as a community to ensure that our response to generative AI will be better? And uh, I'm part of the CHAI community, uh, the Coalition for Health AI, and we're sort of talking about having a place, an assurance lab, so to speak, where we can analyze performance of these models in light of work capacity constraints, hopefully via simulation, and there are data available to perform such analyses. Uh, right now we find ourselves in a situation where the big tech companies have the models, the large health systems have the data, and then the researchers are quote unquote locked out. And we need to create a safe space, a safe place, this assurance lab, where we can analyze this interplay amongst models or work capacity and policies and the actions, not just for generative AI, but I would say also for the regular AI. So that's sort of my point number one, that this unique risk here is we don't study this interplay, uh, particularly for generative AI, which is just gonna make things faster and, and, and uh, more harder to contain. And then we find ourselves in the same place as the uh, past. So if we go to the next slide, so if, if we sort of drill down into the generative AI uh, uh, lens, I think we need to focus on defining and verifying benefits. And so on screen is a little triangle, you know, one corner of that is the, is the model, uh, tons of activity in this space. And uh, we were just told, you know, there's lots of research that will come out saying, do we need a generalist model, a specialist model? Uh, do we, should we do fine tuning, not fine tuning? That's all in that top uh, orange box. At the bottom uh, uh, left is the uh, verifying of benefits. And that I think is on health systems and on, on uh, people in the community that 
can we crisply articulate that by using generative AI for summarization, for pr producing prose or what have you, what is it that we expect to get? And what is our strategy to certify whether we got that benefit or not? And there was an event by the New England Journal uh, last week where uh, uh, we got talking about you know, if we proceed to deployment without verifying if whatever presumed efficiency gain we have can be parlayed into productivity gain, we might find ourselves in a weird situation of doing something efficiently that should not have been done at all, which is sort of a quote often attributed to Peter Drucker, uh, that uh, if, uh, if you just do the bad thing uh, you know, faster or more efficiently, that doesn't help us. And there is a risk of us falling for that if we don't, as a, as a community, specify our benefits up front. And then the last piece is sort of the deployment corner where the operating expense of these technologies is underestimated quite a bit. Uh, there's articles out there that, uh, you know, even if uh, the GPD-4 subscription costs whatever 10, 20 bucks a month, companies are losing money on it. And we heard that that can be fixed. Inference costs will come down and so on. But what about the complexity costs that IT departments have to pay? The typical health IT uh, setup, uh, you know, we run about 1,300 IT systems, and uh, Epic being one of them. And if each and every one comes up with their own strategy on how to embed generative AI into APIs, via APIs into their solution, like, <laughs> our upkeep costs uh, really skyrocket. And what are we going to do as a community to manage that kind of a complexity? And sort of to close out, like, we really need to lean in to uh, the creation and adoption of language models in medicine and healthcare broadly, looking at all of these three items and their interplay. And if we really believe that these technologies are so powerful, and as some say, AI is the new electricity, my question to the group is where is our utility, uh, as in the public utility? We're critically dependent on a few technology companies. We got very little competition that is truly in the public domain, perhaps something analogous to Civica RX uh, in, the, in the genetic drug space. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, close and uh, look forward to the conversation. Megan, thank you so much. And um, I think you're right, we focus a, a great deal on the model. And that's not to say it's unimportant, but really contemplating that um, interplay between the models themselves and the environment is going to be absolutely critical to success. So thank you. Um, next, Christina Silcox. Hi, everyone. Um, this has been great. And I've, I've written down a whole bunch of things that the people in front of me said. Um, I might be moving up a little higher level. So, you know, when generative AI splashed onto the scene, um, one of the big things that people started talking about was chatbots. And I got really concerned. <laughs> and for a couple of reasons, right? So when we think about chatbots, um, you know, the idea that you would be anybody, generally patients, we were putting any information they wanted in, um, and that chatbot would then be giving them information back that patients could interpret as screening, triage, diagnoses um, for everything. And where did we first see problems with that? March 2020, right? So people started putting their symptoms in, and the chatbox did not say they had COVID, um, even though, because the chatbox didn't know about COVID. Um, and so that's one of my concerns. Um, my other concerns are around, okay, so if anybody can input um, anything in natural language, great. Um, but how do we test these systems so that we know they work for people who have different levels of literacy? Even within different levels of literacy, different liter uh, levels of health literacy. You know, my grandfather was a very well-spoken, highly educated man, and he referred to whatever implantable device he had as the ticker thing. I still don't know if it was a defibrillator or a pacemaker. <laughs> Um, we also have people who have English as a second language. We might have, um, if they're using English to, to, to use the chatbot. Um, we also have regional and cultural dialects and terms for things. Um, and so, so now we've, we've, we, we have hugely increased 
the way that that input may come in. And then we are saying, we can tell you everything, any health thing, back. And so I have concerns about that. Now, having talked to some people, I learned that maybe there's some ways around that. Um, and, and maybe kind of one huge model that just does that as one big thing is, is potentially um, a, you know, a complicated way of going about that. And there may be some risk mitigations where you chomp that into some pieces. Um, and so maybe you do the user inquiries in, um, in a way where it does natural language processing and then it structures that query. Um, and then you can do testing. And again, when I think about that, one of the questions I had was, how would you even test that? <laughs> Um, then you can do testing and say, okay, well, you can do iterator. Uh, you know, we can we can do iterator reliability and, and understand whether humans would interpret this question and structure things in the same way. Um, you could then even use rules-based processing to say, this is how we're going to structure a response so that we know that it's giving correct medical response. And then you could potentially add a generative AI on the other side that says, based on this user's query, we think that you could say it that this information that may be more scientific or higher health literacy than this person might have. Here's how we can say it in a way that is more understandable, more empathetic um, to the patient who's asking the question. So a high, something that I was like, wow, this seems impossible. I'm already seeing how, OK, you could break this down. This could, I can see how maybe this could work. So I think a lot of the risks that I'm worried about are potentially things that are solvable. Um, but I do think we need to think about those things. Um, the other thing that we saw was um, newspaper articles about hallucinations. And there was one that was really interesting to me, which was the lawyer who asked, um, asked, asked the ChatGPT to write him up a, a, a closing argument citing case law. And then he asked the chatbot, is that case law real? Because he had heard about the hallucinations. And the chatbot very uh, confidently said, yes, totally real. Now we can question him. Um, but I thought to myself, why did the chatbot lie to him? It's not really the same thing as a hallucination, right? That's kind of like a made up thing. You can see how that might happen. But like, this was really kind of a lie. And it made me think, well, how are these models trained? And when I was doing my paper on bias and inequity, we, you know, one of the things that really came up all the time is, what was the model actually trained to do? And so I looked a little bit into it, and it seems like these, a lot of these models are originally trained to respond to a user prompt in a way that the user finds acceptable. The user says, yes, you answered my question. Um, I was very excited to read Senator Warner's letter to Google because he gave me a name for this. Apparently, researchers have called this something. It's called syncopathy, um, where there is a tendency for some of these models to give the user the answer they want. And again, I think that these user queries was, are very likely to be very indicative of how the patient wants to be answered. <laughs> I am fine. I am healthy. <laughs> I do not have cancer. Um, and so thinking about how do we make sure that we, we test for those types of things. Um, I also have concerns around, with the excitement around generative AI, are we potentially going to have a situation where we're not using the correct tool for the job. And one of the things that I've heard in some of the meetings that we've talked about in some of the articles I've read about is the excitement around being able to take away time-intensive tasks like prior authorization letters. And I thought about that, and I said, OK, great. So we're going to have a chat GBT, write the prior authorization letter, and then the prior authorization letter is going to go to an insurance company, and the insurance company is going to use chat GBT to and uh, read the letter. And I was like, isn't that sort of like there being a French translator between you and me? <laughs> and no matter how good that French translator is, it probably does not make sense for them to translate uh, what I'm saying to French, to the next French translator who translates it back to English before he tells it to you. There's probably a better way of, of doing that sort of thing if you're going to have machines kind of doing both ends, where the machines are talking in machine language to each other. Um, and so I, I'm concerned that with generative AI being kind of a shiny new tool, we're forgetting about uh, tools that might be more effective um, for very specific tasks. I'm also concerned around, uh, and this has come up a couple times, thinking about um, are we answering the right, are we solving the right problems and not just the problems that this tool can do. And so I think that we've heard you know, how essential it is to work with patients, to work with clinicians, to understand what the real problems are, to define the real problems, um, making sure that um, 
that we're thinking about things like clinician burnout, like we're thinking about things about how do we make healthcare work better for patients, and how do we help patients better trust healthcare, and we've seen a trust um, go down, and so I think that that's, that's, that's a real concern. Um, all right, I just have a couple of list things. I want to make sure I only have one minute left, so I want to hit the things. Privacy. I, people are really concerned about privacy. Um, and I, I think that we need to, again, with the trust that we really need, I think we need to make sure that we, we are addressing those privacy concerns in ways that make sense, in ways that's future-proof. Um, AI, and this is not just generative AI, this is AI more uniquely, um, is, a, is somewhat interesting in that when you go to the doctor, it's fairly invisible. And most of the time, you can, see, even though when I go to the doctor, my doctor, I don't know if any of y'all's doctors does, you know, they put the thermometer in my mouth, they put the blood pressure, no, they don't say, I'm gonna put a blood pressure, do you consent? Here's the data behind it. Um, they just do it, but that's fine, I can see it happening. And so I at least know it's happening. Um, and software is, is fairly invisible to patients, and how do we think about that? In a, but again, in a way that's future-proofing. Um, so I think that that's, that's a real question. Um, I'm also concerned, I'm just gonna list a couple things, I'm out of time. Um, I'm really concerned about automation bias. So as these tools look really good and work really well, um, making sure that the people that are supposed to check over and make sure that they're actually right, continue to do that and thinking about how to do that in a way that makes sense. Um, I've heard some creative solutions around that. You may, similar to some of the phishing um, um, mitigation techniques the hospitals use, you could potentially introduce mistakes and make sure that they catch them. Um, and, and so I'm going to stop there, um, but, but yeah, I think that those are some of the, the, big, uh, the big questions I have. Christina, thank you so much. Um, really comprehensive listing of um, some risks there, and I think your reminder that we have to make sure that we're actually triaging ourselves um, and making sure that we're using these tools to solve the most pressing challenges in a resource-constrained environment. Whenever we make a choice to do something, there's an opportunity cost of not doing something else, and I think that's really important. Um, Chris, last but certainly not least. Good morning, everybody. And uh, first of all, thank you to the National Academies and the organizers of, of this day for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, before I make some more specific comments on the, the current kind of LLM era that we are discussing today, I want to be able to also set some context, as many of our other speakers have done this morning, but uh, per, particularly from a healthcare workforce perspective. So first, it's important to note that uh, record burnout exists among physicians and other healthcare workers today, and really in the past few years. Um, AMA uh, measures this periodically, and we measure around 63% of the physician population uh, uh, categorized under that burnout um, uh, designation, but it really varies based on specialty, practice setting. Uh, there's a range, and it's a disturbing range. And putting aside that very serious matter of moral injury contributing to that burnout, um, administrative burdens like prior authorization, a good proportion of that burnout can be explained by what I would call a, con a connection failure. And what I mean by that is the failure of technology to achieve the same productivity and quality gains seen in so many other sectors and industries over the past uh, many years. Um, a lot of healthcare technology has failed at a human level for physicians, but also for patients too. Um, in addition to the race and socioeconomic uh, 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 economic divides uh, that patient populations uh, face and cause dramatically different experiences and outcomes in healthcare in this co uh, country, both patients and physicians collectively struggle to engage with current state technologies, whether it be remote uh, monitoring, patient portals, et cetera. I don't know how many of you have actually spent time with your 76-year-old mother who lives alone and on FaceTime helping her try to log on to a patient portal. How many of you have done that? I think of you, regardless of the age group, several of you have raised your hands for those who can't see. Um, it's really painful. Uh, but to be clear, though, the past 20 years of technological implementation in healthcare likely won't, won't look like the next 20 years. And there's reasons to be much more optimistic. So let's take that high-speed Acela uh, back uh, to the near future, one to two years, as Jen, our moderator, has asked us to consider. Um, 
American Medical Association has some principles we uh, communicated out in 2018, broadly uh, uh, built from the, the physician community of specialties and different backgrounds. And they're still relevant today uh, to mitigate and reduce the risk of, of these types of technology uh, developments. One is that physicians must be directly involved in the design, development, deployment, and adoption of AI. It's pretty uh, a straightforward to understand why that would be necessary. Once it's out there, there must be appropriate oversight uh, mechanisms, whatever those might be, that involve physicians too. But the truth is when you zoom out of that healthcare workforce and you look at some of the other pragmatic concerns we, we have, um, 2022 was one of the worst years ever for hospital and health system finances. Median operating margin dropped 39% from 2021 to 2022. Again, there's a wide range there. Uh, as as uh, Professor Shaw noted too, there may be, uh, we can anticipate a sort of sticker shock in the deployment and adoption of LLM and generative AI models not previously experienced in other forays in digital health. Um, think about the hundreds and hundreds of pilots that have been attempted in the past several years on digital health tools and health systems. This might have a different sort of economics uh, around training and deploying these models around the IT burden that Professor Shaw mentioned that's not quite sorted out yet. And by the way, it's not sorted out by some of the biggest companies that are dominating uh, um, these spaces uh, as we figure out the sweet spot of willingness to pay and performance here. So that's a very real kind of practical economic concern. Uh, I also saw just this past week uh, FDA updated its list of AI uh, uh, enabled medical devices. I think there's around 600 of them. They had a nice little bullet point on there that said, I think none of these uh, devices are using LLMs today. So again, that uh, regulatory space um, uh, still to be determined how uh, that fits into the current paradigms. Um, I think others touched on this too, but LLMs uh, are not just technological or technical systems, they are socio-technical systems. Um, that means that we can't expect to address every big concern with uh, the, the current flavors of AI as a technological problem to be solved that way. And also terminology matters. I don't just mean what is augmentative and what is assistive and so on, though we have lots of terminology around that. But I mean detailed notions of risks and harms and also wrongs that are committed. There's a difference between harms committed and wrongs, uh, and that matters also from an ethics uh, uh, framework and point of view. So physicians tell us that uh, they have a, a concern, uh, many of them have a concern around additional technology that is not done well and risks getting in the way of that patient-doctor relationship. But part of this concern may rely in sort of the popular uh, notions we're talking about around AI, which is AI beats this chess master, or AI beats this physician or pathologist and so on, as a zero-sum game. And I don't think that's an appropriate way to look at things as other folks have spoken to this morning, uh, uh, AI alongside a healthcare practitioner, alongside a doctor, perhaps as a colleague, I don't know what the right terminology is, but those are all uh, ways to, to think about it better. Um, so within the kind of scope of this discussion this morning in terms of other near-term considerations, uh, th this is, I suppose, near and long-term, but what is the end game when you turn a series, uh, when these models turn a series of clinical questions that uh, exist in, in healthcare that are based on biology, that are based on logic, and you turn it into a st statistical or probabilistic problem. Um, we, we need to contend with that and understand what that means, even if the answer is a correct one. Uh, organizational governance uh, is still not well understood for how these models uh, can be deployed in healthcare and health system environments, though there is a lot of really good work, probably with uh, many folks in this room in each of your institutions, um, thinking about this, uh, uh, about not only governance frameworks, but ethical frameworks at an organizational level. Um, from an uh, uh, equity perspective, we need to be really concerned, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Chen touched on this from a Medicaid perspective, is, is not to inadvertently uh, or uh, advertently create a two-tier system and further fragmentation of our patient uh, care system uh, where 
the most advanced and most assistive and benefit beneficial tools are only available at the most wealthy institutions or at the institutions most strongly aligned with some of the uh, corporate entities uh, leading the research here. Uh, we need to avoid that two-tier system. Um, and the, the other thing I don't think I heard too much about yet, but so many of these models, I think uh, Professor Gassami touched on this, which is uh, humans can, can train and uh, develop these models, expert humans, like physicians can uh, do things like reinforcement learning. But what happens when the, the, the sort of intellectual property of humans uh, and physicians are absorbed and humans are relegated to that sort of gig economy work of training these models? And when it spills up to the sort of highest paid uh, 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 professionals in, in medicine and healthcare, we need to consider that question. So in summary, I, I hope we can get to a number of other uh, equity uh, and human dimensions in the conversation, but uh, I'll, I'll end with Dr. Kamara Jones, who's a, a health equity scholar and physician, who says that health equity is simply valuing all individuals and populations equally, uh, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices, and providing resources according to need. So I hope that LLMs, as a colleague and a technology, can, can live up to those basic requirements of healthcare. Thank you. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you in particular for the very important reminder that this is absolutely not a zero-sum game. This is not the conversation that we want to be having or that we should be having. Um, and also, thank you for being here and representing so many of the people that we rely, a lot, we rely upon to care for us. Terrific. All right. Well, we've got some good time here to be able to take comments and questions from all of you. Um, and just in terms of making sure that everyone, including on the live feed, um, can respond to you, make sure you're tipping your uh, uh, nameplate sideways. I don't know what the right word is there. Um, and then do wait for a microphone to come round. Um, and we will start at the back. Thank you. You oh, and I'm so sorry, I missed a direction, oh. and I'm, I apologize for interrupting. Stand up, perfect. Um, and please do introduce yourself as well before your remarks. I appreciate you. So, good morning. Um, I'm Leandris LeBird, here from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Office of Health Equity. And I just want to uh, applaud the panel for the, the observations around um, equity risk, and I wanted to raise just a few additional ones. Um, and this is really in terms of how we are able to program into the model some of these issues. Um, there's a growing diversity, as we all know, in the U.S. population. That means lots more languages and other things are, are being spoken, lots of different understandings of disease and the experience um, of illness. And also, um, we know from our public health data that, um, that there are different health profiles for people who are U.S. born versus people um, who are foreign born, as well as their intra-group differences. And so I think being mindful of these things and how we program um, AI is, is really important. I think another thing consistent with what uh, Dr. Jones would, would elevate is, um, as in Kamar Jones, is that concepts of race and ethnicity, the ones that we use in our data, are really based on um, U.S. concepts and not always understood by recent migrants. And so when you ask some people, what's your race or even what's your ethnicity, it, it, it doesn't register. And then um, lastly, as I've said before, there are cultural interpretations of disease and also how people describe the illness experience. And so as the provider is hearing um, this feedback, I don't know how in the summary through um, AI is necessarily being captured in the way that it's intended. Fantastic. Excellent uh, comments and concerns. Uh, Christopher, do you want to take this first? <clears throat> Sorry if I could figure this one out. Um, yeah, no, I, I totally agree and um, also really appreciate the call on just um, U.S. born versus foreign born and the um, issues around equity. I, I think um, um, 
you know, there's been a lot of talk about like an increase in collection of um, data for social determinants and, and race, ethnicity, and um, standards as such, which we'd really appreciate. But I, I think I also just worry that, um, you know, that this is increasing burden on, on patients and providers, and how do we kind of strike that balance of getting the right data um, and, um, and minis minimizing administrative burden and, um, and are there ways artificial intelligence could help us with that? Um, and, you know, rather than kind of saying, oh, we just need to collect more data to feed in as attributes, are there, you know, other ways that, um, that we could ascertain or infer from the models um, so we can minimize administrative burden for collection of data? But I, I, I totally um, appreciate the, the need to take a more nuanced approach. Yeah, this has actually been something that I've been thinking about as well. Um, actually, in the space of um, early development for for drug discovery and th uh, target selection, things like that, um, it's you know I, I I've been thinking about you know is there concerns around the data that exists right now um, not being particularly re representative of the diverse nation that we live in in, in the world population, um, and so. If we start using AI on that data, are we going to be pressing our fingers on the scale a little bit towards new treatments that are going to work better for people who already have better health care? Um, and I think that, you know, I, I, I don't think that that means we shouldn't be using these exciting tools in this space, but I think we need to think through what that possibly means and how to try and make sure that that, that, that scale, that finger on the scale isn't happening. Yeah, I'll just add one, one quick data point to the, our colleague from the CDC's uh, comment is uh, a study I, I noted from last year, Health Affairs, looked at patient descriptors and medical records, right, and they looked at black patients versus white and found that black patients were 2.5x, 2.5 times more likely to have negative descriptors in their uh, uh, patient record. Now imagine that 2.5x you know, incidence rate feeding into uh, language models and how that gets amplified and systematized, um, and that is uh, an issue to be concerned with. Fantastic. Michael. University, great discussion. Really enjoy all the the panel. Um, you know, I, I've heard some comments from this panel and prior panel, and I wanted to sort of uh, frame it. So. You know, you have the model generation that's sort of being done through uh, very large data resources in industry generally, and that's the group that's able to sort of scale those. And then you have the applications that are generally focused around, you know, health systems trying to develop and adapt these. And there's a gap sometimes where the two groups are not in close coordination. And given the spirit of the meeting is guidance and, and recommendations, I wanted to ask the, the group, you know, do you have guidance under which circumstances where you feel like the model developers and the application developers um, really need to be working together in a loop rather than the application group just consuming the models and using them? I wonder if the panel has some comments on that. Nick, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. That's a great, great question. Um, and I think as a community, uh, we're still figuring this out. Uh, and I would say... The, the, going back to our conversation about that triangle, I think the verification of benefits and specifying them up front is a joint <clears throat> exercise between hopefully the end user, uh, a, a physician, provider, or, or a patient, the application developer, and the provider of the API. Uh, we don't have those systems in place yet. And typically it happens a technology company comes to you with either an API or a product and say, can you test it? Or you know, not really evaluate it, like can you test it and tell us if it's good enough to use? So I think you're, you're hitting a really good point. We need to create those organizational processes that allow co-development. And uh, probably our legal infrastructure is gonna need to evolve because when you say co-development in a health system and a tech company, that the lawyers are like one's on Venus, others on Mars. Uh, and so we need to come to earth on that too. Sebastian, please. Um, Sebastian, one second. I'm just going to make yeah. sure we get you a mic. Is it working? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to reply to this. Uh, just say something about model development. You know, it's not all about the LLM. The LLM is a, is a core component, but then you can build a system around it. 
you, you can build a system around it. And this system development, anybody can do it. You don't have to be at one of the big tech companies to do it. And I think that's kind of uh, a little bit missed in this discussion, like the prompt engineering, having multiple you know, LLMs talking to each other, verifying you know, the output of each other, all of those things, like anybody can do it. Uh, and it's very, very important. It really changes everything in terms of the application. Fantastic. Um, Troy, we're going to come to you for the next question. I think I have it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Troy Tazabaz with FDA. Um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to just highlight because I, I've heard about this uh, spoken by many people, and I just want to actually uh, maybe uh, tap on the Michael's point of view is that, you know, are we solving the right problem instead of actually just trying to figure out what the capabilities are? And uh, Christina, you actually elaborate that or, uh, quite well. And what I've been seeing in the industry, this is very interesting, is that we've kind of flipped product management a little bit upside the head and said that look, here's the capability, let's try to apply it to where it can be applied to instead of what problem are we solving? And, and then, of course, Nigam, to your point about um, the incentives are being misaligned at this point, and as someone who's previous in his life done PNL, I, I get why it's incentivized in the way it's incentivized, right? You have to recoup the billions of dollars that are being invested into this thing. So the question that I have is actually both for the panel but also for the room itself is that is, does the medical system have responsibility in providing some product management inputs on what they're willing to actually integrate into the care delivery process versus getting effectively fed by the industry. Here's a new capability that you should be thinking about this. And I look at numbers all day long, well, I used to at least. Um, but when you have a medical system operating at 1% uh, operating margin and you have the lowest of expenditure in health technology in relation to revenue, uh, procurement officers are going to be very, very conscientious about what they're prioritizing it. So that's a fact that gets missed. And, and as someone who was on the healthcare IT side of things, we miss that as well. And now being on the government, that's a, a point that I try to make. So the question I have is for the room really around what responsibility do you all have to have a consistent voice and message to the actually technology providers for them to actually focus on product development? Um, and we will throw it open to the room, but Nigam, you've been very good and popped your hand up for me, so why don't you go first? <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. No, this is a great point, and just to sort of underscore that, uh, not only health systems work with 1% to 2% profit margins, their spend on IT tends to be under 5% of their, uh, of their revenue. Uh, and any information-intensive industry would be spending like upwards of 15%. So we're asking for a tripling in IT expenditures if we want to build that capability of product management inside of health care systems themselves. So that's a pretty tall ask. I just want to put some bounds on. I think it needs to be done, but in order to make that capital ask, we do have to justify very clearly that if we do it, what do we get at the end? Um, Nigan, that's a great answer and ties back to the sort of what are we expecting here. Uh, Troy, I'd be doing you a disservice if I didn't come to Peter on this one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Peter Emby, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. So um, we've talked about this a little bit, but I just I want to take an opportunity because I don't think we can emphasize it enough to sort of drill down to the issue of equity and disparities again and, and get your reaction to maybe a, a slightly different angle, which is that we know that we're suffering from um, sort of societal, societally, uh, the, the inequities and disparities, and they make their way into our data, and therefore they make their way into our models, and you know, we're, we're, we're well aware of that, and that's a grave concern. Um, and, and we've also touched on, and some of you have touched on, that you know, there's potential uh, risk at, at worsening the, the divide because of the technological overhead and the expense and, and the like that goes into deploying these. And so the the gap between the haves and the have-nots, um, unfortunately, can only grow um, if we're not cautious and careful. So while I recognize that so much of the solution to this is beyond AI per se, uh, because it's about the larger systems issues, um, we're 
uh, we're, we're at a precipice here where we're going to be uh, guiding a lot of what needs to happen with regard to the development, deployment, monitoring, and use of, of AI technologies. And if we don't think about it deliberately, we could further worsen the divide and worsen the disparities. And so I would just love to hear your uh, thoughts on how we address that challenge. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. I, um, I had to turn on the microphone just as I was clearing my throat. Um, I think, um, I think <clears throat> checking assumptions is really critical here. And I think um, I, there's been a lot of kind of like allusions to the financial situation of hospitals and doctors um, and, and how are people just going to like, uh, you know, in their with the negative ca cash flow situations going to um, find resources to pilot new initiatives. Um, and checking an assumption there, it, when, when I look at it from like a state government perspective, when, I, when we talk to our hospital association, our medical associations, those are actually like the most well-resourced of the healthcare continuum. Um, we've got um, long-term care providers, behavioral health providers, um, rural providers, um, and um, you, you know, a workforce that is really not developed or robust at all, community health workers, peers, um, that compared to the hospitals and the medical societies, like, they're, they're, like if we want to talk about lack of resources, they're really, um, so I I think checking assumptions and thinking outside the box is really important along the whole spectrum of, um, of um, healthcare. And I think also just like um, um, just, um, following up on um, Michael's point before around how do we um, kind of have this dialogue about the generation of the models and the application of models and, and incorporate an equity perspective. Um, thinking about public-private partnerships is really crucial. And I'll just say, um, I never really expected to find myself working for the government, but here I am. Um, and I'm finding that it's, <clears throat> it's very, very compliance-driven. Um, and we're always kind of worried about getting um, our, our wrists slapped. And I think the, um, and, and we've seen so much leadership on this from the federal government, which has been incredibly helpful for states. Um, that are less well resourced. Like, I mean, I think in Washington, um, we, we make our right way around the um, conversations like this, but I think um, compared to, you know, like California, the fifth largest economy in the world, <laughs> I mean, um, we, we definitely don't have the resources to um, be dedicated. So, I, how do we kind of think about meaningfully having those public private partnerships? Um, as uh, and and again, calling out that tension between like the the public nature and transparency that's required in the work that we do versus like the the privatized um, nature of art and inherently in artificial intelligence, um, and and working with with stakeholders um, in the in the community, we've had advocacy groups come to us and say, well. Um, you need to uh, audit all of the automated decision systems that have ever existed in your agency. And, you know, we're taking it back to rules engines from like the 1980s. Um, and, and for an agency that's already underwater with um, a ton of work and fires to be putting out, that's just um, like a level of um, engagement and education that we have to be doing, dealing with. So I think thinking about like meaningfully supporting um, public private car um, partnerships and kind of giving cover to those conversations would be really helpful. Terrific. Chris, we'll come to you, and then Jackie, I know you've got a response for Troy as well. Yeah, it's a great question. I think we, we could certainly devote a whole day to it, and it would be worthwhile. Um, I, I'll just you know, uh, elaborate further on your point, which is AI systems have a, a hidden kind of value chain to them that is not really talked about very much. I mean, there, there are... Um, uh, and that, that goes globally, and it impacts the... Um, the energy usage, right? It's not just cost and dollars and how much these companies are charging, but there are server farms that are consuming, you know, and producing uh, carbon output. Um, there are folks that are uh, in other parts of the world that are doing some of this human reinforcement learning training work uh, to make sure that the AIs um, uh, and the language models uh, uh, adhere uh, to to some standards, but there are some issues with how that labor is captured and deployed. Um, so I think we we have a long ways to go to not only think about it at the health system level, but think about the, you know the total economics uh, and value chain of AI to understand how we can avoid some of those those um, uh, pitfalls. So. And building on that value chain notion, Jackie, let's come to you as you sort of dive into Troy's comment as well. Sure. 
Jackie Gerhardt, physician at Epic. I wanted to comment both on Michael and Troy's uh, questions. First on Michael's question, I think it is imperative that all three stakeholders and government, frankly, are brought to the table. So when we first started doing our first use cases with uh, generative AI, we partnered deeply with Microsoft. So we went to their site, they went to ours. We've had multiple calls on exactly what the models look like and how they would be integrated into clinical workflow. And that deep integration and sense of knowledge of what each organization is doing helps to bring the technology into the healthcare space from people that have always been in the healthcare space. So I think that's really important. But in addition to that, before going out and deploying any of this, the key is to have pioneering organizations, like for the example of InBasket that I gave earlier, Stanford, UCSD, UW Health, all were the pioneering organizations that first tried this out on their users real time. And we went on site live in two different patient rooms while clinicians were using the software and asked qualitatively and quantitatively, what do you like and what do you not like? And same thing with patients. You need to know as a patient, how do I want to interact with my doctor, my provider? Do I have them using AI? Do I not have them using AI? How do I know what is my response? And so those are all really key things that we embedded directly into the first use cases and making sure that those collaborations were there. And then Troy, to your point, um, let me just grab this. I have I wrote down a thing, but um, remind me your your first question again. What was my first question? Was the, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, great! Thank you. So, are we solving the right problems? Uh, we'll give the same example of knowing physician burden is so high right now in our country and knowing that many organizations are losing physicians and nurses simply because they can't keep up with the workload. Again, going on site, asking nurses and physicians, what is it that they actually want? How is it that they'll actually use it? It's great to employ AI, let's say, in asking a question about a predictive model or looking at um, the data analytics for an organization, but if it's not gonna actually have any kind of ROI for the clinician who's actually trying to provide the, the patient care, or even for the organization that already has a really low margin, then I agree, are we trying to solve, give use cases of this technology that aren't really what is needed? Thanks, Jackie. Tommy, go ahead. Tommy Wang, I'm a program officer with the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation. I'm going to revisit this question of equity uh, again, because I think it's a very critical one for us to be considering. And in particular, I'm going to ask in the following way. One, thinking back to Sebastian's comment earlier about the one trillion parameter mo model versus one billion, and let's throw in perhaps an upcoming one quadrillion parameter model and some really easy to develop one million parameter models. It's not clear to me from a technical standpoint how much of a difference using each of those LLMs would impact the ultimate end application, taking into account, Sebastian, your point that it's not just about the LLM. And given that technical answer, then how do we think about the standards, the access framework, to make sure that we don't fall into this equity trap um, and I think those two questions are intertwined. It's not just about the governance, but it's also about what are the technical limitations and how to quantify those. Yeah, you know, one, one issue is that right now, this technology is really nascent and most people don't understand, for example, how to build a one million parameters model. I think it can be done. I think for many applications, it's enough to have one million. One million is a lot, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a ton. Um, but for example, le let me just give you an example, just so people have some insight into what's going on. Let's say you want to teach a model Wikipedia. You want your model to learn about Wikipedia. The naive thing that everybody thinks you should do is to churn through Wikipedia. Just have the model try to predict the next word going through Wikipedia many, many times. This is never going to work. All that your model will do is that it will learn to parrot Wikipedia. It will just learn to mimic what's written in there, but it will not truly understand it, and certainly it will not be able to answer questions which are formulated in a different way from what it has seen in the training data. So to have a model that learns Wikipedia, you really need to uh, show it, you need to teach it to the model. Just like you're teaching kids, we need to learn to teach AIs. 
And this, this type of knowledge right now is being developed as we speak. So it's hard, it's hard to put ourselves you know, into the shoes of the future where five years from now, finally we have figured out how to really teach AIs and we can have those small models, those one million, you know, maybe one billion parameter is enough to replicate fully GPT-4. And then we can have you know, different fine-tuned models for different applications, for different you know, fields of medicine, for example, talking to each other. All of this is in the realm of the possible, but it's, it's not there yet, but maybe we should prepare for it. Um, Nickam, go ahead. This is a great point. Uh, uh, thank you for bringing it up, Sebastian. Uh, there's a word that has not yet been said. We've said fine tuning yet, but we haven't said instruction tuning yet. And in order for models to have this impressive performance that aligns with our expectations, there's a lot of instruction tuning that happens in, in many different ways, and we won't go into that. And so the question for this room is, what can health systems and entities such as the American Medical Association, perhaps, and maybe American Hospital Association and EHR providers such as Epic, what could we do together to create the instruction tuning data sets necessary to train these small models that uh, uh, Tommy Wang just brought up? We got to have those things, otherwise we're not going to be able to teach the AI uh, in the right way. Fantastic. Um, uh, Vish, let's come to you next. Vish Alantram, Mayo Clinic. I think um, lots of very good important points here, and, and I want to bring back a couple of things that have been talked about evaluation sets. Uh, and uh, I think the, uh, the evaluation sets are going to be very, very critical, and as we are trying to deploy some of these practical applications for, uh, uh, for LLMs, the biggest evaluation sets have to be some, base of, some language based sets. And we have some fundamental problems in, in which you know, language, whether it's physician notes or, or discharge summaries and so on, they're all identifiable uh, data. It's very, it's, we don't still have really good standards for de-identified data sets. We still all, many of us for most machine learning, go back to the mimic data sets, right? Because it's easy, it's easy to evaluate and so on. We need to think about as a group, how do we create adequate data sets, both for creating these smaller models or larger models, uh, and what I would love to hear from the panelists and others, and what do they think is the role of de-identified data sets to help build these models or evaluate these models? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. Go on. <laughs> so, uh, no, wonderful question. I didn't get your name, so I really would want to follow up with you separately. Uh, I think identified versus de-identified at this point, I would say, is a little bit of a red herring given the fact that our legal definitions of de-identification don't really accomplish what we think it does. And so I tend to stay away from identified versus de-identified, but uh, going back to what something Marze had brought up, like what is the safe space in which we can learn from the patient data that we have uh, available to us. With all the warts and molds it has in terms of the biases that are embedded uh, from human language, and uh, there was this point made about you know, people of a certain category having words of a certain type being disproportionately associated and so on. De-identification is not going to fix that. The only thing de-identification fixes, in my view, is it allows transport of data from place A to place B under the existing uh, legal infrastructure that we have. Um, and so I separate that, but I think the question that, that really we need to figure out as a community is what is the shared source or re repo from which we're going to learn? You know, everyone in the room I'm sure has heard about Cosmos. We know about N3C by NIH. There's, you know, just five, ten maybe such large repositories that are not quite freely accessible. And what can we do to put in place the appropriate guardrails and access mechanisms so that they can be? I think that is the path towards getting to the answer that you, a question you're asking. How do we figure out the sharing of those data sets and hopefully annotations on them to train our models? Fantastic. 
Okay, we're going to go into a bit of a quick fire to take us into lunch. So we'll start over here and then we're going to go Tim, Suba, Grace to round us out. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lakshman Swami. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm, a... I'm so sorry. Could you just stand oh, up for me? Of course, I'm so sorry. Thanks so much. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Um, I'm a, another pulmonary and critical care doctor. I'm also a, a medical director at Medicaid in Massachusetts. I've been practicing in safety net institutions for you know, the past 10 years, and Medicaid is, of course, as you've heard, Medicaid. Um, and I'm very optimistic about generative AI, but I think this is the time I can be cynical. So I want to ask, you know, whether we're talking about the dot coms, the dot govs, the dot edus, I would say all of our systems not only support but perpetuate inequity and widen disparities every day. I think we have to like really accept that, and that's what I see every day with the patients I take care of and the policy I write. Um, given that, why, you know, the cynical part of me says, looking at the quintuple aim and really our failure to achieve any one of those five aims, the, quad, the fourth aim on clinician well-being, almost 10 years ago, worse now than it was then. Mm -hmm. Terrible in 2019, catastrophic today. I feel like AI is like in many ways the only hope for that aim, but I'm also very worried. I'm so worried about the health equity again and it, how it, I think it cannot be overstated that all of our institutions are culpable here. So what is it? Like if you ask me, is there, what, what's the chance I think that anything will get better? I think the chance is very low. I think that uh, disparities will continue to widen. And I don't think it's because it's industry or because it's it, you know, universities or because it's government. I think, I, so my question really is, what is it that we can do, all of us, to actually change the direction here? Because all I see is that the Acela is racing towards widening those disparities. Thank you. Incredibly important remarks, thank you. Um, let's go to the back. Um, hi, Gauri Raman from Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute in DC. Um, as the name indicates, uh, we are committed towards engaging patients and looking for improved health outcomes. So, my question to the developers and uh, other people is. Um, how much of patients are engaged during developing the tool? And how, did you, how do you include uh, variables that are very sensitive, or how do you exclude variables that are sensitive to the patients? And uh, the other, one, other point is, the third question would be, um, what do you do when, uh, for most of the uh, applications or drugs, um, it's the, how the health outcomes are improved. So I see that it does decrease um, workforce, healthcare workforce burnout, but does it improve health outcomes in patients? Um, I believe our reports in artificial intelligence, the traditional AI showed, it only evaluated patient satisfaction, but there are not applications that uh, include improvement in health outcomes. And, uh, I would be interested in knowing uh, what is being done to improve health outcomes. Fantastic question. Nigam, you've done work on this. This is a, this is a really tough one. Um, on the inclusion of variables, um, I'm sort of a little bit of an outlier in my uh, attitude towards that. I, I would say that we have to include everything we have. The, the notion that we have about removing protected information or the, the notion we have around minimum necessary information that you know, sort of derives from HIPAA, I think that paradigm isn't very compatible with this notion of training large language models or generative AI. I think in the training phase, we have to learn from everything. Uh, but in the use phase, we have to put in place uh, policies, we call them guardrails or uh, whatever is the right word in the community, so that the actions that result as a consequence of using the model output do not lead to asymmetric accrual of some benefit. So I make a hard separation in, in for the word bias between what is it of that systematic difference that is stemming in the model output for group A versus group B, and how much of that is a, a, a difference in accrual of benefit in group A versus group B, 
and I, we focus on that accrual of benefit uh, and ensuring that there are no systematic differences. And that's mostly a policy societal issue rather than a technical issue about the model. So that's my current take on how to go about it. Nigam, thank you. And I think, you know, a couple of vectors there where that separation is indeed incredibly difficult. Tim, let's come to you. Hi, uh, Tim Miller from Harvard Medical School. Uh, one concern I have is that these models are actually so fluent and so good at generating fluent sounding text that it's become just easier to generate more and more text. And we're talking about, you know, a lot about reducing administrative burden. But in some cases, my reduction of administrative burden by using an LLM is someone else's increase in administrative burden. And it's, it seems like we're unlikely to solve the problem by just using better tools. And it needs really a sort of system view of like, OK, if, if I'm generating text and then someone else has to read that, we have to rethink, like, how does that dyad work and not just me generating more text? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that means, right, that's a process that could be simplified. <laughs> yeah. I will say I, I did ask um, GPT last night to write an email to my employee saying that um, it wasn't going to put them out of a job, and it gave me like a, an email two pages long, and then I told it to give me an email that was only two paragraphs, so it did have the capability to be more concise. <laughs> Christina, this sounds like your French translator. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Tremendous. Okay, Suba, we'll come to you next. Thank you. I know we are a uh, little bit of time before lunch, so I'll keep this brief. So I want to bring our attention to uh, stating the benefit up front that, that Nigam mentioned earlier, right? Uh, I think the productivity equation is very clear to all of us. You know, let's generate documents, protocols, clinical study reports, et cetera. Uh, but obviously, the use of large language models and generative AI is way beyond just improving productivity. So how can we maybe, as a group, think about how are we creating a framework to articulate this benefit so that we are not overselling, uh, but actually uh, you know, clearly stating the benefits, because we're all asking for, you know, we're, earl we're all early adopters and early believers here. In some ways, uh, you know, it feels like we're flying the plane as we are building it, uh, so to say. So maybe this is an offshoot workshop uh, stemming out of this is to think about how can we clearly articulate uh, that benefit. I'll give one example. I think um, you know, one of the system integrators recently showed that you know, we talk about decentralized clinical trials using digital AI to bring trials to patients. And they actually had numbers to demonstrate that bringing that patient in business class to an academic medical center actually cost less than um, you know, putting all these AI tools and digital tools in place. So I, I think a clear framework for articulating benefits is much needed. Thank you. Super great comment. And back to sort of Troy's point there, we can bring that one patient on business class once, but we haven't created an infrastructure and a system that can repeatedly care for the people who need us the most. Grace. down on my patient, advoca uh, patient advocacy hat. I'm going to double down that we really need that patient voice and care partner voice included here as to what we're green lighting to deploy. Nigam, I really appreciated your insights on verifying benefits, but playing devil's advocate or maybe patient advocate benefits to who? Because I see many technologies that negatively impact my patients that I serve on a daily basis who are living with life-altering, life-limiting conditions, including cancer. And I'll give you an example. It's the batch denial processes of standard of care that's prescribed by their board certified physician. And that's a real special place in hell when that denial hits. Not only for my colleagues in medicine, but for the patients and families that I serve. Because what takes two seconds to deny thousands of claims takes weeks and months to approve and appeal. So again, bringing in that patient care partner voice and regarding the publication that Victor had to talked about, is there an opportunity to propose a structured standard format that is a multi-stakeholder blessing or approval of things that we do green light that are ready to advance now? Terrific. Thanks, Grace. Steve, let's come to you, and then we'll go to the back, and I think we'll round it out. I'll be quick. 
I'll be very quick because I think uh, Grace stole a lot of my thunder. So I like the the point, uh, Graham, that you talked about relative to those three places where you have the models, the verify, and the deployment. I was going to talk a lot about the the verify piece, and in addition to the structure that I think you need to figure out what are the right benefits that we want to focus in on, which you just you just mentioned. But the other is the issue of the deployment, and that one bias that we haven't talked about yet is spectrum bias, where you have the, the disease burden and um, the, the, the complexity maybe of a population is different than another population. And if you look at the ecology of healthcare, out of a, a typical month, a thousand patients or individuals, maybe 800 will have symptoms. Maybe 113 will actually be seen in primary care. 21 would be seen in a, a hospital based out patient clinic and eight would be seen in a hospital. So I think if we focus just on the large systems in regards to how we deploy that, we're missing a large group of individuals. And if we don't focus on the patients that are not seeking care, we miss a large group there. But also in the deployment, it's going to be very complicated in a hard system in a .edu versus a three doc in rural Washington in regards to the resources they have to deploy these type of solutions. Steve, absolutely, and I'm glad you sort of pointed back to some of Chris's remarks earlier there as we think about what you do in Washington State. Final question up at the back. I'd, I'd love Sebastian's thoughts on this, calling, calling you out again, sorry. Um, I think it's just a matter of time until we get to the point where the marginal, using Tom's language of language as an intervention, it's a matter of time where the marginal cost of life-saving interventions is zero with these systems. And I think we can all agree that there's a small set of actors that are well positioned to, to build and maintain these systems. And there is this boundary line that I think we will approach where if it is not a public good, that barriers to access are completely removed, like we are screwed because mm -hmm. we're essentially only allowing like zero marginal cost life-saving intervention to reach people. And, and one thing I, this is separate context, but the, the cost of scaling traditional AI systems with health IT infrastructure today is like very big. So this actually serves as an opportunity to really be excited about equity. We just have to be comfortable with public ownership and management of these systems at a certain point. parallels between the situation we're facing now and the situation you know 20 years ago but i mean the interactivity and the ability to respond and provide direction i, I do see this as different in nature and something oh, no. we should of brace course for. of course it's much better yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's <laughs> infinitely better and, and it's going to be even more impactful what i meant was more like there could be an argument that search engines should also be a public good that's all i meant <laughs> well, why do <laughs> um, it's a, I, I feel like this is a conversation that maybe doesn't just need lunch, but maybe needs a happy hour. Um, but uh, let's uh, maybe wrap that up there. Um, uh, Marcy, Christopher, uh, Nigam, Christina, uh, and Chris, just want to say thank you so much for your remarks today. Thank you, everyone, for a tremendous discussion. Sebastian, our de facto panelist, I uh, really appreciate you all. And I'll hand back to Michael to give us the most important instruction uh, where we can find lunch. Lunch, and I apologize uh, that um, my bottle of sherry upstairs won't last for a whole happy hour <laughs> equivalent. Uh, but uh, uh, again, what an extraordinary morning. Uh, and uh, you know, I was thinking about the presentation that uh, indicated that we have to essentially have questions that haven't been asked before in order to test the system. And I hear a lot of questions that haven't been asked before in this room. So it would be interesting to use that as a pilot, to identify them and put them together and see what turns out. Extraordinary. Uh, we're going to go to uh, lunch, which is in the Great Hall. Enjoy the ambiance there. 
think great thoughts, as you already have. Uh, and um, uh, let's uh, uh, come back uh, at about 105, 105? Um, yes, 110. Uh, and uh, uh, as we um, close and move into the Great Hall, let's give another round of applause to both of our panels today.